Da -da -da. Hello and welcome to Nerdist Book Club, where we have to sing our own jingle. <laughs> we are live on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. I'm Hector Navarro, and joining me, as always, are some of my best friends, Rachel Hine and Maude Garrett. Hi, you two. Hi. Hey. I, like I should change my name as well. You could change it to whatever you Dejah want. Oh. Doja Thoris. Thor Deja Thor Thoris Thor would be good. Deja yep. Thoris would That's be good. good you can, you can, I am Dotar Sojat, my right arms, or the book has a different explanation. But to everybody at home, thank you so much for joining us. We are back. Uh, we've got these uh, once a month episodes, and we're so, so excited to be back. We've been looking forward to this all month. If you're new to Nerdist Book Club, please introduce yourself in whatever chat you're in and let us know what some of your favorite books are. So tonight, we discuss the entirety of the novel. A Princess of Mars, right here by yeah. Mr. Edgar Rice Burroughs. So just real quick, this is a Disney mm -hmm. edition that they came out with. The first three books are in this uh, thick boy, but A Princess of Mars is the first one. Uh, just a quick little bit of background in case people didn't know. Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote it. It was originally published in serialized format in The Pulps in a magazine called All Story Magazine, originally published in 1912, the year the Titanic sank. And it was an early example of science fantasy with pulp fiction, planetary romance, and Western elements. Burroughs was inspired by the work of astronomer Percival Lowell, who at the time believed that there were canals on Mars, even though that has since been super duper disproven. So, been waiting many years to ask this question. I'm very excited. We will start with... Actually, Miss Necromancer has a great comment here. John yeah, Carter yeah, I is love just this. Mario. Deja is just Princess Peach. And the Martians are Koopas. Changed my mind. I mean, pretty spot on. Uh -huh. Pretty spot on. Uh, pretty great. Um, so the question I have been dying to ask my two friends, we're going to start with Rachel. Rachel, what were your overall thoughts? What did you think of A Princess of Mars? And then we'll go to you, Maude. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> I like the pro the prose style actually. I know some people in the chat um, were saying that it was a little dry for them. Um, the sort of uh, gosh, where was it? Here it is, Game Wizard. Um, but I liked the prose. But it and you know, this book inspired a lot of my favorite childhood books that I read in the kind of sci-fi pulp pulp. Um, sub genre, I guess, from the fifties um, and sixties. So Heinlein and Bradbury, who I think bring a, you know, different time uh, than the teens, the 19 teens. Um, <laughs> there's another version of that. that we've looked through. But, um, <laughs> but basically that um, they're a lot more emotional and they have, they're, you know, especially Heinlein in the 60s is like very trippy, a little progressive. Um, but I think Bradbury as well, who was not mm, perfect, um, but a lot, a lot more of the kind of emotional stakes than I think this particular story. But because it did pave the way for so many things I love, I can appreciate it. On the other hand, there are a lot of problem, obviously problematic things. It was written in 1917. And, you know, I'm usually when I'm reading something or watching something, I try to think of it in the context of the time, but it's yeah. still just hard <laughs> to mm -hmm. not see all of those um, tropes and racist and misogynist undertones to Absolutely. all of it. But I, and I didn't dislike it. I enjoyed the audiobook, um, and I like epistolary stories, uh, which is if you don't know because i just had to relearn this is the the genre of like written through letters or um, mm. other pieces of like what's it called secondary sources kind of so mm -hmm. dracula is an epistolary mm -hmm. uh, movie <laughs> like <it's> zelda <laughs> It's, I believe it's World Dracula Day today. So that's on it. That honestly scared me a little bit because you mentioned Dracula and then I, I heard a shriek. Like, and I was it's like, light out still. On the he, West Coast, so. he should be asleep. He should still be asleep. Uh, yeah. You know what's very interesting too is I didn't really, I don't really know that much about the pulp 
era of fiction and science fiction. And I think it's so fascinating to, to go and read a lot of that stuff. And it did lead to a bunch of classic sci-fi writers and, and it kind of jump started their careers and everything. But like that idea of like so many of these stories starting, like here's a true story you're never going to believe, but this guy told me this and this is real. That is actually pretty common in a lot of these old mm -hmm. serialized pulpy, you know, even the first Tarzan, which is also Edgar Rice Burroughs, I think starts with like, like, you know, or Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is I got a journal from a guy in the Arctic mm -hmm. and like he found this crazy person in the in the Arctic. You're never going to believe this. He's a monster and this and this and this. So pretty common, pretty wild. Um, great comments in the chat. Everybody is talking about the book and the writing style. Uh, I, we are going to talk about the movie a little bit because we had a fun movie night, which was fantastic. But Maude, you read the book. Did you mm -hmm. listen to the audiobook or did you read the story? And what did you think of A Princess of Mars? Go. So there's two different audiobooks available on Audible. One of them is free. And so you don't even have to pay, which I thought was fantastic. And so I was like, yep, let's go with that one. I really didn't like the narration. <laughs> um, and that paired with that prose type sort of language and it was being super sort of like, for me, superfluous or florally, really took me out of the book. And I really struggled sort of like focusing on this. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm really glad I watched the movie before reading the and finishing Same. the book. Same. It really, really helped visualize it and understand the characters and understand sort of like the the purpose and point of a lot of things that were happening. Um, I have to give a demonstration of what I had to put up with. Please. So a lot of the time we are talking about John Carter <laughs> and he went to Mars and he was a warrior. But they were had to, they had to explore a different territory, and I was just like, <laughs> I cannot stand this. It is just like, and it it just was not kind of grasping my attention. Mm -hmm. What's really cool is that a lot of the time I've forced Hector to read a book that I have loved, and I really <laughs> like that we have the inverse of that now, where Hector absolutely worships this book, and. I would not have done this on my own accord. And so I'm so grateful for that. Hearing you talk about this book, watching the movie with you was such a fantastic experience. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, because I know that we've got so much to get through and I don't want to I mean, drag out each question. So I'm going to no, punch please, through please. your initial reactions here. Yeah. So it was, I really struggled with the language in it uh, and the misogyny in it and um, Deja being a possession um, mm -hmm. The world building was, you know, it was like 70% world building, 30% story. And for me, I just needed it to equal out a little bit because uh, yeah. I was grasping it enough to be able to kind of go with it. You know, you had your green Martians that were your, your tasks. Tharks. 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 It is an mm -hmm. H. Yep. That mm -hmm. were, you know, very sort of nomadic and more of your, your savages. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 I get this. I get this. Um, I did like the fact that this was written in 1912 and hearing a sci-fi depiction of a planet that actually does exist and hearing their take on that, I found that to be incredibly fascinating mm -hmm. and like what the point of differences between Earth and uh, Mars was. I thought that that was really great. Mm -hmm. Were there any barriers that you encountered reading it, Raci racism and misogyny? Yeah, there were some uh, cr cringe and flinching moments, yeah. um, yeah. which I, I wanted you, to sort of write down, but there are a lot. You, yeah, and you described the language as being really that sort of, and then that audiobook that you that you did an impression of. I can imagine that also being a little bit of a barrier. Don't you don't you just guys prefer the Taylor Kitsch performance of this character by way of Keanu Reeves, sort of like I you know? Mean, yes. <laughs> Do I tell the story about John Carter? Well, as hold well? on to that. Hold on to that. I mean, if you're powering through the rest of the questions, Mod, yeah. what's the what's the answer to the fourth question? Would you recommend the series or read more of the books? Like, I would you do I either would of those? I would do a disservice. I would like to leave that to you because I think <laughs> that you nurture it and take care of it a lot more than I would. I really appreciate that. We <laughs> do have I a lot enjoyed to... the movie so much more than I thought so I would. Oh, I, yeah. wanna, I, want to, I want to Martian jump right into that right now. Yeah, let's uh, do it. First of all, in case anybody's confused, the, the book was originally oh, published wait. in parts in 1912 and then first put together in 1917 as a novel. Um, uh, did you see a comment you wanted to call out, Rachel? Was there something well, you wanted to grab? Well, just about the, about the movie night. Just, uh, oh, listen, we'll we got a little, we, what that was like. <laughs> we got a little sloppy. Maybe it's best that it was not streamed. 
<laughs> because well, were, we had to pause it a couple of times as well because we were like, I'm sorry, sure. we were talking for so long. Hector, and what we, is happening? We, we put the captions on and I made sure to to relay just a few little pieces of, of, of major info. But I want to say this. I want to say this to Rachel and to Maud and to Ali and then Lee if he, he's watching this because he's on vacation. He watches it later and to the chat as well. I was telling these guys before the show started, I something happened with this book that I didn't expect to happen, which is now I love this book even more because it is now attached to the memory of my friends coming over right out of quarantine. I finally got to see my friends, hug them. We're all vaccinated, watched a movie, a 3D movie in my house. And then <laughs> by the end of this movie, you guys, everybody was the perfect level of drunk. <laughs> Perfect level of inebriated. You guys were cheering at some of the cheer moments, the crowd pleasing moments. And so like now I love the movie even more. And I already had really nice fond memories attached to the film and to the book. And so I'm just so happy that we got to do it just because of that movie night. It really did make all of this worth it. Just for the record, too, I want to say I don't love the actual text of this book. I don't love this writing by Edgar Rice Burroughs. What I do love is the world. What I do love is the world building and the characters and other people interpreting it in different ways and the live action movie and the fact that, you know, reading this along with the book club and I'm and I'm in the discord every week and they were talking about um, how much world building there is. I mean, Burroughs will spend three quarters of a chapter describing to you the customs of Martians because he's figuring out and it's cool. And then the the last quarter of the book is like, and then John Carter, and then I went and did this and did this and did this. And so to me, the beauty of this world is like what other people can do with it. I have comic books that are John Carter comic books that I think are pretty good. They made a, a role-playing game, which makes perfect sense because this whole world oh, is set up yeah. like an RPG. It's like a Dungeons and Dragons style world. So they made a beautiful role-playing game that I think is, to me, that's the best of what comes from this stuff. So yeah. I would love to jump into talking about the movie you guys came over. We watched it in 3D. Rachel, I want to start with you. What did you think of the movie adaptation? And you watched it. You took my advice, too. You didn't even start the book until mm -hmm. you until after you came over and you watched the movie. But hit me with your overall thoughts for the movie. Did you think it did a good job of adapting the book? Go. Totally. Well, first, I just want to highlight this because I agree. Um, Game Wizard Something Wicked This Way comes by Ray Bradbury, one of my favorite books growing up and a very spooky, I think it's 80s, maybe 70s movie. So we should cool. do that. Um, cool. I agree with everyone in the chat um, that we need more Wula in general, Wula. in everything. <laughs> um, I'm not just saying that about myself. I'm named for the um, dog creature on Mars. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a walking turd with teeth. Let's be it's real. A, it's a it's a penis. He looks. He's a penis he, creature. Um, he does. It's like a penis and a toad had a poop. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't quote me on that. Him. I love this ugly little dog so much. Um, I really enjoyed the movie. I Hector by the end of the night, I was like, maybe I should get a three D <laughs> because it yes. made the visuals. I thought the visuals of the movie were really like especially that it came out in 2012 yeah. and it looked better than a lot of yeah, the CGI movies. And I won't mention because I didn't want to get yelled at, but some CG movies that are very dark and don't look realistic at all. Um, mm -hmm. It's just not a, a style that I particularly like, um, but it did help rain. Like I think like Maude was saying rain in the important parts of the story for me in advance. Yeah. Because yep. much like, you know, in YA, there might be a makeover scene or a ball scene. And if you're not interested in that, then it feels a little superfluous. And mm -hmm. uh, in this, I have to find the comment. Um, it was something about, it was just very much, it felt like teenage boy, whatever the equivalent of teenage boy YA, where there's just a lot of, you yeah. know, we're going to explain to you how the guns work and, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and we're going to tell you all of the, all of the furs and silks and women that John Carter has won by killing the, some yeah. of the sparks. And you're like, okay, all right. Yeah. Was, go ahead. I was going to say like, there was very, very funny scenes. Like we were talking about how they used the music to, when he was like learning about the gravity change yes. and that was really funny. And we yeah. got some, we got some good leg shots. No. Yeah. Absolutely. His shoulders, remember? His shoulders. Yeah, it was, I will say um, 
there were quotes. I was looking up kind of the, because I remember at the time when the movie came out that there was, um, you know, a fair amount of discussion around the title of the film and the marketing yeah. of the film. And what year did Frozen come out? 2013. So around the same time, I knew someone who was working at Disney and it was a similar kind of mindset, I think, of how to market these films to try to get boys into them. Yep. So like the for some of the trailers of Frozen before it came out and became obviously this huge, huge phenomenon, um, focused a lot more on on Sven and, uh, you know, Hans. The, yeah. Hans, and it didn't really show. I mean, the movie is about the relationship between the sisters, ultimately, and it really didn't show that at all. And the quote, I think I have the quote from Andrew Stanton. Uh, he said, I'd already changed it from a princess of Mars to John Carter of Mars. I don't like to get fixated on it, but I changed princess of Mars because not a single boy would go. And then the mm. other truth is no girl would go to see John Carter of Mars. And I think while I understand that from a Hollywood perspective, yeah. it is deeply frustrating because 2012 yeah. wasn't that long ago, but like I will put that aside for now. But I do think that picking John Carter is the most generic mm. nonsense yes. name that doesn't, say anything about how wackadoo this sci-fi movie is yeah <laughs> that like you know I, I mean i don't want to disparage anyone on the marketing team that did, just did their job but like it does have a kind of female gazy vibe to it with um taylor kitsch and mm -hmm. and their shoulders and cool you know and there's a dog character i mean mm -hmm. shoulders cool battles there's dog. love not true yeah. love, but there's one love. There's some yeah. tradition. I think, I think that for me, the more I think about it, the more I am, have landed on, it should have been called John Carter and the Princess of Mars, like a Harry Potter situation. Right? So then it, if they had done a sequel, it could have been John Carter and the Gods of Mars. And then Ooh, John Carter. I'd watch that. Right? John Carter and Warlord of Mars. Or, or John yeah. Carter, the Warlord of Mars. Like you could have had that sort of John Carter comma or John Carter and the to kind of keep it going. But um, I think that it, the, at least when talking about the movie, um, for people who have seen it, and even for people who haven't seen it, I feel like everybody kind of understands, like marketing whiffed it a little bit because yeah. the movie itself does not deserve, it's ultimately like it's box office or even maybe kind of it's reviews, which it's may have even, super you know. Fun. Yeah, super fun. Maude, what did you think of the movie? What did you think of Taylor Kitsch and him being mostly kind of naked? but still sort of covered up with some leathers and straps. Mod, overall thoughts on the movie, and do you think they did a good job adapting it? Um, I completely agree with the name uh, sake. Like I remember I was, when I'd first moved to America, when I was like, you know, over here in 2012, figuring out if I wanted to live here, it was blasted all over the billboards. And I remember it was like Taylor Kitsch in his sort of like, you know, barbarian-esque type outfit. Yep. Yep. And it said John Carter. But it said John Carter like, you know, and I'm looking up movies that came out with just a name for the title. Yeah. And you've got like Carrie, Gloria, yeah. Rosetta, yeah. Tristana. And you're like Scarface. Um, Sounds like a biopic. Exactly. And it just like, it was such a detraction. Like who mm -hmm. is John Carter? I don't care enough, but you're right. It needed a byline. It needed sort of like, and the exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I, I mean, I didn't see it, but I really bought into the, what's the opposite of hype? Disdain. I sure. bought into the, wow. the slurs and the attacks and like the marring of John Carter being a, a failure. Mm -hmm. um, it being like, what was it? Like $200 million to make. Yeah. And it just uh, I, didn't yeah, do what plus, it was supposed to do. Plus a hundred million for marketing. I think in the in the end, I think it made it didn't lose like five hundred million dollars for Disney. I don't even think it lost two hundred million. I think it essentially broke even, which is still a failure. Like it yeah. like I think when it was all said and done and then DVD sales, whatever, that it was that it yeah, it basically came in under their total cost of making the movie. And it's and it's a shame because it's um Anyway, I just, you know, you, I have thoughts about other types of movies that are sort of were, were deemed successes and got infinity sequels. And it's like, well, if those kinds of movies, yeah. if something like Transformers can keep getting these movies made and, and they can keep being this kind of really lowest common denominator entertainment and people still come out and see them and they make because millions. Because the name, you know, it, the yeah. name well, carries has, and it's like decades old. Does. You say it Transformers, you know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Absolutely. It's got a really enriched, ingrained history. 
Absolutely. So apparently you have Flash Gordon and and other similar, you know, mm -hmm. of these types of characters that the, from a similar time and way more people know about Flash Gordon than about a princess of Mars, even yep. though that launched some of this. And I do think Ms. Necromancer earlier was, I love saying that they were Mario and Princess Peach and comparing yeah. to the, <laughs> but Then Zach was like, Mars has a third gravity, but John Carter could jump like he was the Hulk. And Ms. Necromancer goes, yeah, I told you, he's Mario. <laughs> it's me, Mario. <laughs> I know, I love that. And I, yeah. I also think that they're, um, Oh, I just lost my train of thought for a second. I'm so sorry. I think no, a, no, I think no, a no. I think a really important comment here is from um from a uh, uh uh oh let's see where is it did I lose it where did it go where did it go a very What's important comment that I think we should highlight is from uh, Ali Mattingly who says 100% Hector sells the 3D experience I think yeah. that's a key. <laughs> Because really I think did. we should we should let everybody know yeah. it wasn't just the movie John Carter. We watched short films. Yeah, I put on it little scenes great. from Jurassic Park and Pirates oh, of the Caribbean. And all oh, these I, had other... a, I had a Disney animated short theory, which we cannot talk about. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, oh yeah, we also okay. ended the night doing our own ver. We basically scream sang at the TV. There was no actual yeah. karaoke <laughs> like technology involved, but yeah, we great. needed a sing along. Yeah. So that's my scary. happy place. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Shy, yeah. Shy Little Violet in the, in the YouTube chat says, "Am I the only one who disliked the movie?" Absolutely not, Shy Little yeah. Violet. A lot of people definitely disliked it. That's okay, uh, but I think that um, uh, the experience it, helped. I think. Yeah. Being with you guys, and also just the, I will say the 3D was really good. Really good in it. And yes. having, I was having CG, like landscape, all of the cool, you know, special effects and, and art, having mm -hmm. that like layer added something to me that I have been missing in a lot of big blockbusters, I think, because they do, can, they can feel very flat when you're dealing yes. with you know, computer graphics. Um, it's so, yeah, I'm sold and I'm still dead. Let, let's do another one. Uh, we'll we do, we'll do another yes. one. We got, I wrote more. you my list. I wrote you my yeah. list. Really quickly, right. um, Aaron, AKA Game Wizard said, it was adding on to the Mario analogy and saying that uh, Sola is Toad, which is yes or no, but mm -hmm. Wula is Yoshi. Yeah. <laughs> like this case, she's adding on to itself. Like this is the best analogy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes it's Mario. I love that we're only gonna show pictures of Woola. Of, of Woola, that's Can we it. just, actually, yeah. can we get back to see Taylor, Taylor Kitsch? Absolutely, there like, we go. There okay. we have it. I think so it's like, a pretty good, you know, in, in the Disney book he was completely Disney naked. Was yeah. he? Yeah, in the book he was. And his nipples are out, his nipples. Which is, which is pretty, uh, pretty salacious for yeah, Disney, I think. Disney, yeah. But, uh, you know, I remember when the movie came out that that sort of diehard fans of the John Carter novels and the Edgar Rice Burroughs work were like, oh, they really made it kid friendly. And like part of the appeal of these novels is that it is very like sexual and very, you know, all the all the people on Mars, men and women, all the red Martians are all basically naked and they're all wearing like some jewelry and gold little coverings and all this kind of stuff. And I remember thinking like, yeah, but to me, that's not that's not the cool thing about this story, about this world is that is that there's some sort of PG-13 or rated R yeah, kind of like, naked, you know, yeah. this, this also, teenage boy's idea of sexu sexuality. And so I, it, that's, yeah, that's not the, that's not the core of what it is. So. Well, and I think, or I remembered what I was going to say, which is that I read about more of the books in the series after, because I probably will not read them, Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> but I would totally watch a sequel. Yeah. Give Taylor Kitsch another chance in any I, project he's done. Cause he's can I tell my Taylor Kitsch story yet? Please tell oh, yeah. the Taylor Kitsch story. So we watch John Carter in 3D. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, Taylor Kitsch. And we're like, man, what's that guy up to? I'll tell you, he's eating brunch at a cafe in Venice next to me. He walked in and I was like, Oh my God, John Carter's behind me. <laughs> like, what? And I was like, he just, he, he just said. So I staged a photo with my friend so that we could have, and he's there in his trucker cap and his flannel shirt. And he's just like looking down the barrel of the camera. At I, I'm glad you did. I texted you and I was like, oh, dude, you got to say what's up. You got to say that you just saw John Carter. I'm glad you didn't because I don't know. I don't know if you were he's mocking him. Probably. I know. It, 
<laughs> I know exactly, which is. But I've also is, seen Friday Night Lights, and I've interviewed him before. But he was the, the one of the few um, actors that I had to regulate because he was being um, a little bit bored in my interview, and so mm. I I told him to. Yeah. He, that it was. Can I swear? I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I basically, he yeah. was lying the whole time and making up this joke, which was absolutely not true. And I only have three minutes. And so I was just like, you're talking shit. Your breasts starting to stink because you're talking so much shit. Can we get back on track? Wow. And he was like, <laughs> he actually really liked it. He really liked it. And I was just All like, right. whew, that was a risk. He was either going to be like, we're done here. Or he was going to yeah. laugh and be like, hey, okay. that's yeah. Yeah, all right. You got a bit of fire under your butt. And I was just like, I will, reg I've got one more question. Let's make it count. I, I think that's good advice for everybody watching is if you ever see Taylor Kitsch in the wild, I guess like neg him, I guess be real mean <laughs> <laughs> and he'll appreciate it. No, I'm kidding. Please don't do that. Please tell him you genuinely liked John Carter. I think someday that somebody will come along and get the rights and do like a TV I show agree. or maybe well, a, a, a well, video game, something, something. Is, uh, maybe Disney you know. must have rights now, but I think it was in the public domain for a long time because yeah, it's so and old. I think I think after the film, I think some years lapsed, and I think it did go back to the <laughs> Edgar Rice Burroughs estate. I think clear eyes, full hearts, bad breath. That's nah. funny. That's good. Um, so I, I wanted to really briefly talk yeah. about and, and address the, the, the racist elephant in the room and, and how the book depicts these kind of uh, the, these ways of thinking from back then. Um, I grabbed some pretty interesting little paragraphs that I wanted to read and kind of use as examples, but maybe even challenge the paragraphs because I don't think that, that I don't know if I agree a hundred percent, but these little bits of writing I got from the RPG that was written oh. in the John Carter of Mars world. These people are crafting together this story. And just like in the world of Dungeons and Dragons, I know that a recent conversation has been about, let's move away from the idea even of races, because there's this weird inherent inequality sometimes in a role-playing space when you, uh, uh, when you attach like a specific trait or personality to a race, like that kind of thinking. So this is just some interesting paragraphs discussing the writing of Edgar Rice Burroughs and some of the messages in the story. Quote, in A Princess of Mars, we see a brave and competent hero struggle with social customs and romance in ways that counterbalance his otherwise hyper-competent presentation. He's a very, he's even more hyper-competent than the name of the wind main character. This guy <laughs> is, he is perfect at everything. He truly is. And I was- What do they call the male hair, um, Mary Sue? Gary, Gary Stu. I was half expecting Maud to call me out on it and be or like, Hector, how could you? character in most <laughs> heroes' journeys. Correct. Mo exactly. So Just separate. Yep. So this so this paragraph is saying that he struggles with social customs despite his hyper competent presentation. Even though the Barsoom stories are products of their times in many ways, they also showcase Burroughs' ability to craft a hero who looked past cultural and racial differences in ways that shamed many of his contemporaries. So. Although there is real blatant issues that would need to be worked out if you're retelling the story today, this writing is saying, hey, if you compare this character in this story to other pulp stories of the time, it's still those kind of like stories where it's like, here's a character who's going to meet and interact with a, an alien race that is maybe a metaphor for like Native American people or, you know, marginalized groups. And he's still going to come to think of Tars Tarkas as a brother. So that's something, but it's still like eh, it's it's gonna it's tricky when you get into metaphors like that when you're you know when you are depicting a group of of green aliens as completely savage. It's like it's the noble the sort of yes. noble savage trope, um, yep. and and the you know white savior colonizing yep. a new place. And it it's interesting too because I think it's. I, I do really like his writing style, but, and it is such of the time. And then you think about, you know, there have been plenty of recent, semi-recent films that play into these exact tropes. I'm looking mm -hmm. at you, Avatar. Um, mm -hmm. And this, the, those are going to be baked into so much of the writing at this time. Someone yeah. in the chat was also pointing out you know, on the other end, I have to find it actually, um, Ian Powell, that it's anti-eugenics, which even today can be considered progressive, which is Interesting. definitely true. And so there are some 
elements, much like any complex piece of work from a very long time ago where there are kernels there where you're like, oh, you're, you could get it maybe if you, you know, lived in a different time. Um, but there's still a lot there that's, that's uncomfortable. I also think what's interesting and kind of, I wish that, I wish that, I guess the, the movie, I almost said show, does this in a, in a better way because obviously it's being adapted later. But I, I, I do like the idea of the front, exploring the frontier, exploring the wild west and, and mm -hmm. Mars being kind of a, a stand in for the wild west and the gold rush. Mm -hmm. um, and it reminded me too, a lot of Lovecraft country in, in the, you know, Oh, I, I froze. I can't tell if I froze or not. It's just, <laughs> a little frozen, uh, yeah. Uh, um, whew, but in the sort of like fell asleep in a cave and then got beamed to another planet and the science, yeah. isn't, you know, it's not hard science, which, you know, didn't happen as much, I think, in this era. But I do, I do like that um, some of the themes in there, it's just a lot of, a lot of the, um, sort of white savior, noble, savage yep. tropes are so it's the whole story is that it's hard to kind of yeah. separate the two without it, 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 it in the back of your head. It's avatar. It's dances with wolves. And I also wanted to mention, I forgot the name of the project, but like a few years ago, I think I saw somebody was hitting me up with a, with a Kickstarter campaign where somebody was doing a comic book that was a, an updated retelling of John Carter of Mars, a princess of Mars. But instead of making him a white soldier who fought for the Confederate South, he was a black soldier from the United States civil war. And I'm like, I want to see that story. The version of John Carter, where he's a black man from the United States from that time getting transported to Mars. And how would this character behave oh, yeah. differently? That's kind with, of what Lovecraft was trying to achieve in a yes, way. Yes, yeah. I agree. I agree. And I think that right now, a lot of fiction is trying Lovecraft to like ex explore that. I think a lot yeah. of fiction is trying to take some of these old tropes and kind of update it. In terms of the misogynistic ideas yeah. in the story, here's another paragraph from that role-playing game book that I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. Quote, it's hard to deny that Burroughs wrote in a time that was more accepting of certain inequalities that modern audiences find more jarring. Burroughs was keen to portray women as strong and courageous and active as much as his audience, culture, and time allowed. Okay. Also, the sexism of Barsoom is the white knight chivalrous variety where women are sometimes presumed to be less capable of battle or defense without male intervention. It is never of the abusive yeah. woman-hating variety, true. which I think I is true, that. but there is still, a, you know, there's still a conversation there about how far we've come in in sci-fi and fantasy to, you know, that we've had Princess Leia and Ripley and all of these different heroines that have changed the idea of what a Deja, even Deja Thoris in the movie that we watched, as she was being saved by John Carter, I forget which one of you were like, oh, rolling your eyes like, oh, he's got to save her. And then she grabbed the sword and killed somebody. I was very you, excited at that you, part. You guys were like, yay, yeah. we did the, yeah, yeah. the it thing was I was lovely. commenting on. You know, it was, it's very interesting. And the book has a few mentions about Deja Thoris being like, a scientist and then the movie goes with it the movie's like she's a she's like the head scientist of of mm -hmm. the city of helium and she's trying to do this and that so she was so, also uh, like there is a part where she cracks the shits like she's like no you defied customs you don't understand it this is actually offensive and i'm not going to talk to you and that is mm -hmm. in a way a sign of strength and like yes. setting a boundary and being like i don't appreciate what you did so i'm going to put my wall up and you know that was sort of I, I don't think it was necessarily done in a bratty way. It was right. really identifying a miscommunication that was happening. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But then there was also that part at the end where she was just like, oh, no, you know, he's dead and so I can't live and I'm, you know, yeah. fading mm -hmm. into nothing. Oh, no, I'm a possession. Oh, I, now yep. I'm someone else's possession and you must repossessify me. <laughs> yeah, I don't a know princess if that's a is word, but... Hmm. She's in another castle. Absolutely. Avery Adventurer says, I would love to read a modernized, reworked wow. version of this story. And I think I think John Carter has inspired a bunch of that stuff. And I think you can find oh, yeah. specific, you know, there's comic books that have referenced this. There's um, there's just tons and tons of stuff. So now we come to the section where we've got the rest of the hour. We can go into specific moments of the story if you all want. If you want to talk about mm -hmm. anything specific from the book or from the movie, what did you like? What did you not like? Rachel. There were changes as well. There were, there as 
is which is good. Number one, Willem Dafoe. I <laughs> well, I did not realize Willem's a friend. Please. <laughs> when he yes, when he showed up and started speaking, my head exploded because I just didn't. I was like, well, I'm gonna watch them. It's not like I did research before to remind myself who was in the cast, and that mm -hmm. was an extra special uh, <laughs> part there of he the is. experience. But I also think there were folks in the chat saying um, that they could see it as a TV series or reimagined kind of concept like that. And I think especially looking up the ser the book series after I read the book and learning that the things get wild later mm -hmm. um, and the canon changes and I don't know everything about it, but it sounds like there were sci-fi sci type things about John Carter before he even gets to Mars. I don't know if I yeah, that was the additional books and can verify so, that. I know that at the beginning of this book, too, Edgar Rice Burroughs is telling us about John Carter. He's describing himself. He's like, I look about 30. I think I've been alive for a long time. Yeah. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's already something weirdly supernatural special about him. And the movie barely touches on this when they show a photo of John Carter, like an old timey photo where he's sitting in a chair in black and white because, you know, you have to like stay still for hours. <laughs> as the as the photograph was being yeah, taken, the that um that uh the the kid in the beginning of the movie who plays Edgar Rice Burroughs, he's the nephew, and he's talking about Uncle right. Jack, and I was like, yeah, that's a kid from Spy Kids, and then one of you were like, oh, if that's true, he's married to such and such. Oh yeah, okay. that was, yeah, Megan, Megan, um, trainer, oh, Megan trainer, yeah. yes. And I was like, great, but uh, but he talks about his uncle Jack, and and if you think about him being a kid. And still getting to be bounced on on Taylor Kitsch's knee, but Taylor Kitsch still looked the same. It's like the movie barely goes into it, but I don't think it's it's just weird. It's I think it's this whole story is Burroughs throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. And well, I um, think in the later stories, it gets you know expanded, and that I thought was whew, super interesting. Yeah. Um, and we also have a couple of questions from from the chat, which I think uh, Hector, you're probably best. I'll try to answer. Let's see. Try. Can you explain? Yeah. What was with the ending in the cave? I didn't understand the bodies hanging in the mummified old woman. Was that ever explained? I need to reread the second book. Clever girl. I don't recall exactly, but I do know that the book ends and it's like, it's like, will he ever get back to Mars? We'll, <laughs> find, we'll have to find out. He well, does. Yeah, yeah, it's a serial, and that's also yeah. part of the the style. I think is thinking about mm -hmm. it in these little bits, which you know, similar to uh, our uh, racist um, Lovecraft, but also mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite books, The Martian Chronicles, which we read a million years ago on book club. Um, I was just a little bit though. Hmm. Only just a little bit of it. Yeah, we only read well, a little. We, bit. Did we end up reading the whole no, thing? We were, I think we read the whole thing, but I you may have been out one of those oh. weeks. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. But, Got it. But it's mm -hmm. it's a collection of stories that were published in magazines like many of these serials were, and then turned into a book of the same kind of theme. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a question about the comics. Oh, I'll 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 Where answer it. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then real quick, back to that question about what happened at the end with the mummified bodies. Like I know that as we were watching the movie, when Mark Strong showed up, he's the bad guy. There yeah. were questions about this Mark Strong character. The movie tells us that they are therns. And then I said to you guys, I was like, the therns are the bad guys in books two, three, and beyond. And they're kind of the yeah. big bad. But they and were introduced early, yeah. They, and that they, really shifted a lot of the story. And yeah. Like, you know, yeah. They brought them early. And I feel that maybe the stuff in that Arizona cave, maybe that had something to do with therns. I can't recall. I also wouldn't be surprised if no, it like like uh, uh, like Miss ne Miss Necromancer said, it was never explained. It never it, it never went into that. I'm not sure, but I need to reread it because I know in the second book, John Carter and the Gods of Mars, he literally kills Issus, the goddess that they talk about in the first movie yeah. that they worship. Like Issus apparently is a real person. They find her. It's kind of a Wizard of Oz situation where she's being worshipped, but then John Carter and his group of allies learn that like, oh, she's actually a thern. And is manipulating everybody and shouldn't be worshipped and is killing people and it's all a bad situation. They kind of dethrone her and slash 
kill her and take the whole system down, which is a which is kind of like an anti-religious, yeah, you know, sort of a slant a little bit. Which but, reminds me, we still need to read the rest of his dark material. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, also, Nick the, King, yes. <laughs> yeah. Give me a warrior woman. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give That'd be great. Was there a question about the comic books? That yeah. I are to... the, well, there were some from the 70s, it sounds like. And then there were also yeah. some from Dynamite. So are the you... comics? Ooh, there they all are. Are the comics from Dynamite any good? I know there are a ton of them. I think there are even ones about Deja Thoris. I have liked about half of them, but I have liked some. They, they Dynamite will put out a comic that's like, here's the history of Barsoom thousands of years before the John Carter story. And I'm like, that's interesting. Then they did a couple of crossovers because it's another Edgar Rice Burroughs character. They have a John Carter meets Tarzan. And I'm like, I eat that shit up. I think it's fun and it's really corny. And, you know, they found a way to do it. Uh, that one was called Warlords of Mars. Um, and there's some, yeah, there's the, the, the main most popular comics are the 70s ones that were put out by Marvel Comics. Those were the comic books that a lot of people first encountered John Carter of Mars, including writer-director Andrew Stanton, who did the movie. When he was a kid, he was into Star Wars. And then they went and put out these John Carter comics that same time. So he uh, is, that's how he got into the uh, into the story. Yeah, there's some there's some pretty interesting comic book writers and creators that also worked on some of that stuff as well. So if you're into it, I think it's worth checking out. They also did a Disney John Carter movie comic like little mini sequel where they put out a thing where where some of the Tharks are telling a story about some of the war hoon, which were those gnarly green Tharks that are in the movie that, you know, so there's a cool little like four issue mini series oh, that. Cool. um it has to, yeah, that I liked it. It has to do with the Tharks. I want to say like Greg Pak wrote it. Anyway, hit us up with any other questions. Daniel Day Kim would be a very cool John Carter. There's lots of stuff you could do with it. So, beginning of the movie, beginning of the story, Brian Cranston is in it. Yeah. All oh, right. Blonde Brian Cranston. I that forgot. Was that was fun. Confederate blonde. No, he, he, he was. He was of the Union. In the book, he was a Confederate character. Oh, in the book, they're Confederate. Yeah. Powell, that, that's right. I was right. going to say, right. that is a smart, that was a smart yeah. change. Uh. Um, yeah, that was fun. Uh, then when he eventually gets to Mars and meets all the Tharks, we talked about Willem Dafoe. Uh, I was also, yeah, like listing off the actors who played these Tharks. It was, um, there he is, there's Willem Dafoe. The other guy was the big buff guy. That's Tal Hadges. He was voiced and performed by Thomas Hayden Church. Yes. Was the other this guy, the bad guy Thark. Sandman. They, I have to look that up because it was driving me crazy. Yep. Mod, <laughs> Mod, Mod thought he was a good guy while we were watching the movie <laughs> because he had one tusk missing. Oh no, so, I thought yeah. Yeah, Mod kept going like, oh, maybe he's gonna be the leader of the Tharks because he's because he was damaged and because you know he'll be like he'll he'll underdog be a hero. Story. Yeah. Underdog I'll story. And I was just like, mm, maybe we'll see. He, no. <laughs> he's a bad guy. He definitely got killed. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad we read this despite its awful issues. I think it was far back enough that we can still appreciate it, probably being right at the cusp for that. Um, it was so long ago. It was over a hundred years ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like yeah. someone Ooh. that read a lot of Jane Austen back in high school. Like it's really super interesting just to see where in the time they are to have that conversation. But I've never really read like really old sci-fi. Mm -hmm. And like, I think that that is so fast. Like even in movies, like in the 60s, 70s, 80s, like Star Wars is a great example, trying to predict what a futuristic world looks like. I always think that that's so fascinating. And I think mm -hmm. that over a hundred years ago, trying to describe to, and like utilizing gravity uh, the different Martians that are uh -huh. there, like establishing that world building, which is necessary, went a little hard on it. Yeah, um, but I remember reading another bit. comic, another comment ages ago where it's like, you know, as soon as you have to build this world, it's like, what are the farming? Um, wh what are you farming? You know, you have silks. Who's making the silks? Like this all needs to make sense because it's sci-fi. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. What is the food like? And the book does go into that detail that, you know, John Carter's like, oh, when I came across some like Martian peoples, the first time I had meat. And it was from this animal that they have. And then he's talking about the plant life and the milk, like Martian milk that I yep. think came from a, from plant, a plant also. It did. Some yep. kind of a cactus thing. Rachel, you had a thought. What do you want to say? Well, I was just thinking, so I've been just reading a lot about um, genre storytelling and like building magic systems and things like that. And there, there are so many like questions you're supposed to ask yourself about how the world works. And I find it really interesting that I think in some, you know, you've got 
hard magic and soft magic and those with like really strict rules like name of the wind where everything is very laid out or you have you know a little bit more vague magic rules um but that at one point all of those pieces of information of what they eat how does the society work all of that they're all kind of just like very much in there kind of reminds me even of Lord of the Rings where when I was a kid and tried to read it, I was like, there's so many Thorin, Doran, Lauren names. <laughs> Everything, you know, I, was, I, don't know, I, was like, I loved the Hobbit, which we read. Everyone should watch that if they haven't. Um, Lauren. But I, I think when you're building the story, what's interesting is having that information, but then, you know, you know, it's just a different way yes. of writing a modern style writing now where you, might use it to advance a plot in a different way, or it shows up in an, the next book. So you're expanding the world. Absolutely. Um, but I just thought that was really interesting that a lot of this era of writing, they just are like, here's how everything, and, and it's so impressive, but it's also like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> and now <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah. It's a little much. What about the characters? And that yeah. was another thing. There's no, there was no real emotional resonance for me in the book. I think they do. Um, a pretty great job of doing that in the movie for yeah. how quickly you kind of get into this situation and if you had to pick CJ actor, you know, characters. Yeah. I think, I think for me, the most emotional moment in the film, I mean, I told you guys as it was happening, I was like, this is my favorite part. And you guys were like, really? And then really paid attention to the scene where he was fighting the war hoon flashbacks yeah. with him burying his wife. And, <sighs> and I, and I loved it. Yeah, super great, super epic. Not in the book. Easy for me to pick the most emotional moment in the movie. But if you yeah. had to pick the most emotional moment of the book, what would you two pick? I feel like, I don't know. I feel like maybe I would pick some of the romantic language that John Carter was was speechifying at Deja. Like, I'm like, that. that's maybe the most deep that it gets is him saying, like, you have my body, you have my heart. For all of eternity, Deja, I, w I want to marry you, but you know, but it's your mileage may yeah. vary. Is there uh, anything emotional in it? Oh, I have another one, but uh, go ahead, Mott. Um, I I hear what you're saying about emotion. The hardest part, and this is what we're discovering more and more with book club, is first person and world building together is really difficult because you're yeah. world building through the lens of that person, and it helps in John Carter because he's describing it as he's experiencing it so like as he learns you learn um yeah. but i think that world building is usually really really difficult through first person lens and when it's someone like if i'm first personing through john carter mm -hmm. i like i'm automatically a little bit detached especially when it's a 1917 john carter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i think the most emotional part was actually talking about the tharks process and we, there was a conversation in the comments a little earlier about eugenics saying that at least yeah. edgar rice burroughs doesn't really he's a bit anti-eugenics i don't think that's necessarily true because yeah. they would kill all the offspring that weren't hatched in time uh -huh. there was this like really kind of savage and detached way to raise their younglings they unified them instead of having parental kind of mm -hmm. uh, affiliations there but for me i think that that was probably the most emotional part which was learning about their customs and some of them being really kind of wrong or a negatively affected some of them are really cool like i really love the fact that if someone starts a fight with you you have to match their weapon or less than i was like yeah. that's really cool i dig that yeah you can't um, fire a gun in a yeah exactly exactly and it's uh, like honor and all of that but yeah. in terms of raising raising their young that was probably the most emotional sort of like impacting part that i had where i was like mm -hmm. oh this is really really tough and it, there is such an emotional detachment to youngling yes yeah. Younglings, which is a Star Wars term, but we'll like we'll accept it. We'll take it here. Yeah, Matt, I mean, I remember trying, what <laughs> <did we> do? <laughs> that little kid is dead. He's uh, yeah, I remember dead. that part. That part in the movie where they where the the Tharks are like, you know, a third of them didn't hatch, and then ta uh, and then Tars Tarkas is like, T wipe them out. Don't leave anything for the white apes, and they kill the rest of the unhatched babies. It's very it's very sad, and it's that. very. Uh, I think maybe the most emotional. Oh, you change it all to red. Nice. Um, in the book, the scene where Sola, who in the movie was played by Samantha Morton, British actress Samantha Morton, who is like a sensitive Thark, tells John Who's Carter. interchangeable with Rebecca Ferguson. Tell me. I'm yeah. Wrong. You'll never see those two in a movie. Together. Samantha Morton, Rebecca Wait. Ferguson, where uh, where Sola tells John Carter. Like, in, 
in the book, Sola knows that she is Tars Tarkas's daughter, and Tars yeah. doesn't know. In the yeah. movie, they reversed it. Tars knows his daughter is Sola because of because of his mate, because of his ex-wife or lover, and then the fact that she died, and he knows that they she kept her egg and that they raised the kid. Yeah. Um, but but the part in the book where Sola tells John Carter the story, and then when John sees Tars Tarkas again, and he tells him. Sola is your daughter and tells him the entire story. And then he goes into Sarkoja's hut and he says, I know you were responsible for this woman dying 40 years ago. And I know that the Thark warrior who loved her just found out. And he said, he's going to tie you up to a horse and he's going to do it in the morning. And I've come here to warn you because I'm a gentleman. And then the book is like the next morning Sarkoja was gone and she was never seen from again, which is such a like a classic cheesy Western, you know, yep. uh, you know. Um, and in the movie, she gets killed by one of the white apes and it's this big, vicious, violent battle thing. So she anyway, was just so angry. Yeah, that Sarkoja was so much hatred. Absolutely. But uh, let's talk about how much you loved Wula. Would you have a Wula if it was real? Need more Wula. I don't know if that's what I would picture. I'm going to shave my dog. I'm going to paint her brown. <laughs> oh my god, her tongue is out. Can you see that? Lip. Her oh, little wow. tongue. That's her tongue. I love it. <laughs> oh boy. It we looks like she's just point. it looks like she's just tolerating you right now, Maud. It's great. It's great. Hey. <laughs> that is the deppiest face. Sorry, oh, keep talking. Like, yeah, my answer is yeah. Oh my uh, goodness! Are you so, a so cute. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, uh, all right. Well, do we have any other uh, any other chat? Uh, also, what did you guys make of the atmosphere factory at the end of the story? They actually Dude. explain how there's an atmosphere on Mars, which now today we know there is none. Right. And in 1912, I don't know if they knew that there, if they knew for a fact that there wasn't. I'm sure maybe scientists were like, no, there's no they, atmosphere. They probably thought, well, it, it, I will always bring all things back to the Martian Chronicles. Um, but that, that also explores the canal idea and the sort of like canals of water. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I really liked the world building. Um, I just got even, at the moment we start the book, when you get the foreword from Echoris Bro, I mean the mm -hmm. nephew, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> when he describes, it's like page two, describes John Carter. He was a splendid specimen of manhood, standing a good two inches over six feet, broad of shoulder and narrow of hip, with the carriage of the trained fighting man. It's just like, okay. <laughs> Why don't you marry him then? <laughs> <laughs> it just, I was really, I, I, I guess my, I mean, not wrong. Whoa, yeah. uh, what is it? Broad of shoulder and narrow of hip is a, a descriptive term I have not uh, heard specifically, but like. I love it. It's like an upside down triangle. It's a very Yeah, nice I get it. It's very, yeah. yeah. But I do really think that, you know. For those of you who have been with us for a long time, know that Maude and I are usually on the read the book camp. But um, I'm really glad that we watched the movie. A, it was very fun. But B, I feel like if I had just started here, I would have been like, <sighs> I, I did. I, I was about six chapters in. <laughs> I was about six chapters in when we read the watched the movie, and I was just like, I was not enjoying the book. <laughs> like when it was like, my name is this, and this is a story. I was like, no, I was not retaining anything. And then I watched the movie, and I was like, able to get context. I was like, oh, this is what's going on, and this is the moment. And this is a bit different, and huh. but mm -hmm. yeah, that is the only time. Yeah, Miss Neckerman's a bounce. Wow, wow, he was. I think uh, yeah, I, I do not describe that way. <laughs> if I if and I had the time and the budget one of my passion projects would be that i would hire voice actors that sound like the cast from this movie and then do an audiobook of of these voice actors like acting out the book you know because it, this narration but done by like a taylor kitsch impression would honestly be much better it'd be fine oh, the, totally. the, the this this tars tarkas but read by someone who's doing a willem defoe impression it would be awesome so uh Dude, maybe someday what a reunion yeah yeah you know maybe someday <laughs> I can, uh, if I have enough money and power and all these poor actors are still alive, I'll, I'll hire them to do like an audio book that nobody will 
care to listen to, but I'll be like, yay, we got Willem Dafoe and Taylor Kitsch <laughs> back in the, in the studio to read this old ass book. Um, uh, yeah, Maude, your, your impression, impression did sound like Foghorn Leghorn. That's great. It's not only Foghorn Leghorn. I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, I'm going to go onto Mars and I'm going to get a, 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 a club and a sword <laughs> and I will attack my rights for my woman. No, it's a little bit like, um, the notebook, which I'd sort of recently seen. And yes. the, the father of Ali who had like a oh, lot of money mustache. with that mm -hmm. big mustache, who's clearly classist and racist. And mm -hmm. I was just like, this yeah. is really indicative of the time. This mm -hmm. is really indicative of the language and the accent. And I couldn't really shake that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'm really glad that you did come over to watch the movie and didn't finish the book because, um, yeah, this is. I think this is my favorite example of, no, 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 the movie's better than the book. Please, you you have to believe me. The movie's better than this book. Uh, I think Ms. Necromancer said in the chat, I was there, Rachel. I didn't watch the movie. And the only thing that kept me going was, my dumb running commentary in the discord miss necromancer have you seen the movie since have you or do you have any plans to watch it i'm so so curious i hope that more than just yeah i just want to do audio dramas more than people giving the book a shot i think i just want people to give the movie a shot uh yeah. i don't care people can take or leave the book it's fine but i want people to, <laughs> to give the well, movie a shot and so well, yeah and i think the that speaks to i mean we we just did the shadow and bone trilogy and while i when I read it the first time, I got frustrated with some of the characters. We talked about it. If you have not uh, watched those, go back. we'll talk about it forever. And I know Maude in the Discord community, you all have been reading the sequel books. Um, we read Six of Crows and we're doing Crooked Kingdom next. And guys, the books are so good. That's so right. good. Told you. So good. <laughs> it's, and, and that's an example of a writer growing as, as yeah. she's writing, but also the world is so interesting that even though I have issues with the original trilogy, what comes out of that next and the show adaptation, which I was a big fan of, but especially the spinoff books, that's, I mean, if you can create it, that's the hard part. I would imagine as someone who's researching this right now, it's like, how do you invent a whole world and a magic system and things that, you know, all of the rules and, and sort of the kind of technical aspects before you get to, character work even before you get mm -hmm. there so i agree mm -hmm. and i think you know it inspired so many science fiction stories that we love too that i am glad that i read it um but i'm glad it's that it's, it's, it's the dna the yeah it, it's the the jedak the jedda the jedak yeah, yeah. Um, the yeah it's, it's the dna of all of our favorite stuff and and i'll say to kind of wrap up uh before rachel you tell us what we're reading next month um, once again, just a huge thanks to everybody in the, in the Nerdist book club who read the book with us this month, especially for Maude and Rachel who have been bugging you about this book for years. Mm -hmm. Uh, because again, you guys made it so much fun and that movie night is what made it all worthwhile. And I have such great experiences and memories and, and the Disney, uh, karaoke at the end of the night was <laughs> choice. So, uh, so thank you guys again for coming over and we will do other movie nights and, um, and there'll be lots of fun. So Rachel, Tell us what we're reading next month. Ooh, it's exciting. So we got um, some great recommendations from y'all because we wanted um, to read some sort of queer story for Pride Month. Obviously, I will ship many characters in a story, whether or not they're canonically queer. So every book club episode can be queer if you have the right mindset. But next <laughs> month, we're going to read <laughs> Cemetery Boys from 2020 by Aiden Thomas. It's an award-winning book. It's been recommended to us a few times. We're super excited to read it. So um, your homework is to finish the book. We'll see you. I have to pull up my calendar now because I did not do that. It's the <laughs> last Wednesday of next month, which is... The last day of the month, the 30th. The 30th. So uh, mm. June 30th, join us. We're going to be talking about Cemetery Boys. Um, and that doesn't mean we don't want to talk to you throughout the month. So uh, make sure that you keep talking to us about what you're reading. If it's not the book that we're currently reading, tell us, give us your recommendations, use hashtag nurse book club or join the geek bomb discord. If you haven't joined yet, Maude, can you break it down for us? 
I can. I'm just reading the blurb of Cemetery Boys and I really like it. A yeah. trans boy determined to prove his gender to his traditional Latinx family summons a ghost who refuses to leave in Aidan Thomas's paranormal YA debut, Cemetery Boys, described by Entertainment Weekly, uh, Weekly as groundbreaking. I'm loving this. I'm going to get it with my credit now. Uh, but, yeah, we have an after show. Uh, Hector has created a six-page document. So we're going to go over chapter breakdowns. <laughs> we're going to spend 30 minutes. I would love to hear from you about what you loved and didn't love about it, what your feelings of the movie is. But we do that in like a voice call that you can only get access to if you're a backer of Geek Bomb's Patreon. So head over to patreon.com slash geekbomb, join up. You get immediate Discord access. We will see you over there. And then throughout the rest of the month, we are covering different books and we are doing um, a book club and putting the Discord audio into the show as well so we get to chat about um, Crooked Kingdom, which has gone over so great. So I'll see you guys over there in just un momento. We'll see you guys there. We'll see you next month. Thank you so much for joining us. We will be picking another book for the following month, so send us your recommendations. We love you all, especially Woola. Woola. Oh, <laughs> bye, my little turd. Oh, bye, puppy. <laughs> oh, you guys were grossed out by Wula when he sh first showed up, and by the end of the movie, you were like, I, Wula, yeah. I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, bye. Uh, bye. <laughs> See you guys next month. Da -da -da. <laughs>